Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a talk show podcast on the Beatles called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, sometimes the future, their history, their music, the group years, the solo years, anything that comes to mind we can cover here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of the program. Hopefully you know my syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, which is now on up to 50 radio stations. And I'm also part of uh, another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, another biweekly show, which is um, viewed on Facebook every other Monday night. So uh, many ways there for you guys to be familiar with my work. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts and two very special guests who I will introduce in just a few moments. First of all, a man who wrote for the New York Times and their classical department for many years, writing lots of reviews. And he's also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and got that something how I want to hold your hand changed everything. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. How are you doing? Very good. Very excited about uh, our program. Mm, uh, me too. Like I am with all of our shows. But we have <laughs> two great guests here with uh, a really interesting topic. And our other co-host uh, has been manning the fort at New York's WFUV for almost 40 years. He's done lots of great work there playing new rock classic rock interviewing all sorts of people he is their pretty much their resident beetle guy and that's darren devivo hi darren howdy everyone thanks for listening and hello to our guests yes our special guests on the show this time are the authors of the book it's over here now all things must pass away harrison clapton and other assorted love songs this is the cover right here. Darren's holding it up as well. It's all about the careers of those two guitar greats, how they came together in the 60s, formed a bond, a great friendship, worked together, and what their friendship and their work relationship meant to them. And let's introduce the two authors here on this show. First of all, a man who's best known for a podcast show called Producing the Beatles, and that's Jason Krupa. Hi, Jason. Hi, hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for mentioning the podcast. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have you on more often as we talk about some of the work that you've done on We'd that love show. To. Absolutely. And Ken Womack should be no stranger because half of my room is loaded with his books here. <laughs> and um, apart from co-writing this book with Jason, he's written a couple of books on George Martin, uh, Maximum Volume and uh, Sound Pictures. And also Solid State, the book on Abbey Road, a recent book on John Lennon as well. He's always busy coming up with something new on the Beatles, always working on the next Beatle book. Ken Womack, welcome mm -hmm. to our show. Thanks, Ken. I'm proud to be in that room. <laughs> You're all over the place. It's going to be you and, um, and Mark Lewison and Bruce Spicer just dominating this whole room. <laughs> In good company right there. Absolutely. So we're going to be talking to those two about their new book. But as usual, we have lots of Beatle news to get to. And it's been a busy last few weeks. So let me start off by uh, saying that there'll be a major announcement coming this Thursday about the Let It Be box set. It will be, I believe, five. I've also heard six discs. I'm not quite sure. I it's think. The uh, what's that? Because the Blu-ray was the sixth disc. Okay. For the box set, Joss Martin will have a remix of the Let It Be album. There'll be two discs of rehearsals and jams from the Apple Studio Sessions. Also, the first Glenn Johns mix from January of 1969. And John's 1970 mixes of Across the Universe and I Me Mine. And also new 2021 remixes of the original B-side version of Don't Let Me Down and the 1970 single version of Let It Be. And then there's the disc uh, featuring uh, Dolby Atmos, 5.1 DTS, and high-resolution stereo mixes. Um, 
I think a lot of people who have heard about this have been quick to point out that there's nothing from the Twickenham rehearsals, and they seem disappointed about that. Would any of you like to comment about that? Maybe that's because they haven't heard the Twickenham rehearsals. <laughs> I mean, not terribly inspiring. <laughs> I think also the Twickenham rehearsals were not recorded on a, a multi-track board, were they? Right. Right. Yeah. Just so on film. You would end up with the Nagra sound or, or the, the film mag strip sound. Uh, and they probably don't want to put that on the CD set. There'll probably be mm. stuff from, from Twickenham in the um, Peter Jackson film, I would think. Oh, yeah. All right. Isn't there anything that might be that could be done today with today's technology and improving the sound off film? Someone has um, actually already taken all the Nagras and um, <laughs> using, I think at the time, there was only spectral stereo, uh, uh, has made a stereo set of the complete Nagras. So there's, there are things you can do. But, you know, if it's the Nagras, you still got, you know, occasional beeps and um, slate mm. calls and things like that. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know with today's technology, if you can remove any of that stuff, you know, maybe there's so many advances that are made periodically. I just, I don't really know, but I think um, for some people, I think because of its historical importance, putting aside whether they think they're great performances, they probably feel that something should be represented on there. But as we all know, you'll never please every Beatle fan that's out there with all oh, these releases. Yeah. Are you guys surprised? Go ahead. Was, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say there are people, um, you know, who were really upset that they're not having the rooftop concert in the CD set. And it, it just seems to me that, OK, look, we're going to get the rooftop concert complete in the Peter Jackson film, according to Peter Jackson. Um, that's going to be in stereo or 5.1 or, you know, probably 5.1. Uh, the files will be available within days of it being on television. You, if you really want the rooftop concert on CD, you can burn a CD pretty easily. Um, and it, it just seems to me that everything that's in the Peter Jackson film that we're not getting on the CD set that's a plus because it means we're getting <laughs> sure. that stuff plus the Peter Jackson stuff. And I, I don't right. understand why people are so upset about it not being in the CDs. Um, plus also, you know, we've had the rooftop concert more or less all this time on, uh, you know, there's a yellow dog bootleg, there's various others and they're, they're built from the Nagras. And so, you know, maybe it would be better in stereo or 5.1, what all that, but we know what the rooftop concert is. And I don't, I think people, you know, like, like Jason said about the Twickenham stuff, maybe they haven't heard the rooftop concert because it's not a concert. It's really a recording session dressed up as a concert. And, you know, they have multiple takes of several of the songs and there's some pauses for setup and there's, you know, different things that are not what you would have in a concert. And I have a feeling that, you know, people might be disappointed if they put that out on the CD. And I think it actually would have taken more than one CD as well. Um, so I think they're better off. We're all better off having it in the Jackson film and not in the CD set. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are multiple takes of, of get back and you know, a couple of takes of don't let me down. So it, it does seem, seem, seem to be, Probably for casual listening, not the most exciting. Is thing. there the I, possibility that the Peter Jackson film will be on Blu-ray after it's been shown, and uh, there being like an audio, almost soundtrack that could come out as well of some of the bits taken from the film? Possibly, because huh? that would be the place for people to get the full rooftop concert if, hmm. you know, if they're old fashioned like I am that wants the physical, you know, item, I have a Blu-ray here and right. it's on there. Is that uh, the Blu-ray edition of All Things Must Pass Away? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, no, you did one, did you? <laughs> um, I guess uh, hopefully, I'm hoping that the, will, the, the documentary will come out on, on Blu-ray and there, you ha there you'll have 
your home copy of, of the full rooftop and the possibility of they, you know, taking out some of the selections out of the uh, soundtrack, putting that out maybe as a disc or CD and audio disc. Um, do we know anything about what we were told that the original cut of Let It Be is going to be coming anywhere? Because that was supposed to be coming out as part of all of this, the original film. Well, in the original announcement, they said it was going to come out, but I, the way I took it, I, I thought that they meant a separate release on its own, a standalone. I could be wrong, but that's how I interpreted it. Anyway, I still think that no matter what, there's got to be a DVD and Blu-ray of the Peter Jackson film coming out. But when that will be released, be nice if it was out for, if it was out for Christmas. But yeah. since it's going to be on Disney the end of November, that might be pushing it. Yeah, mm. probably not. Mm. Are you guys surprised they uh, they have one of the Glenn Johns uh, compilations? I was a little little surprised at that. Yeah, um, I guess I ha it hadn't occurred to me that they might do that, but it kind of makes sense. I, I thought that was what they should have released when they released "Let It Be Naked." Right. Yeah. Right. And which mm -hmm. one are they choosing? Because there's more than first, one. The first one. Why not the second one also? Unless there's too much redundancy? Well, it, it's almost complete redundancy, except for, I guess, I, me, mine, and across the universe, which got added. So, you know, for that stuff, you're really better off with the bootlegs because the quality is, is great, what's out there already, and it's out there already. So, yeah, you know, far no, be it from I'm not me really to advocate buying bootlegs <laughs> oh no absolutely not never never i understood what those were <laughs> all right let's get to some other news and news dropping today from paul mccartney's company mpl concerning his upcoming book the lyrics due out november 2nd it contains the words and the stories behind 154 of paul's song lyrics that span his entire career and it has a healthy a very healthy amount of solo material in there. I counted, and I might be off by one or two, 86 solo songs. Some surprises would be Paul's Liverpool Oratorio uh, piece, Ghosts of the Past Left Behind. Also, nothing too much just out of sight from the Fireman's Electric Arguments. The biggest surprise of all is a song we've never heard of. It's called Tell Me Who He Is, which is an unreleased Beatles song. The press release says that the handwritten lyrics were discovered in one of Paul's notebooks, believed to be dated in the early 60s. Early compositions include I Lost My Little Girl and In Spite of All the Danger. It takes you right through McCartney 3 with The Kiss of Venus, Women and Wives, and When Winter Comes, which actually is an older song. With this release, the British Library has announced they'll have an, an exhibit running from November 5th through March 13th, displaying Paul's handwritten lyrics revealing the process and people behind all these songs. Anybody want to comment? And Check My Machine will be included. <laughs> that right. had to be in there. <laughs> Which I is guess... good. I've always wanted the words to that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's got a thing for that song now since it was in the, the Rick Rubin uh, documentary. I don't know. But um, I'm very pleased that it's very balanced between the Beatles and the solo stuff. Uh, Ringo's announcement, which he made on August the 12th, is that he will have a new EP, Change the World, out September 24th. Includes the new song and single, Let's Change the World, which you can now hear on YouTube, written by Joseph Williams and Steve Lukather, both from Toto. And of course, Steve Lukather working with Ringo for many years in his all-star band and uh, on several of his albums. The EP will come out on CD and cassette. And for download and streaming with a cost of $11.99, the cassette is strictly a U.S. release, I'm told, for $12.99. Also, there will be a 10-inch vinyl coming, but not until November 19th. Ringo said, what a blessing it's been during the year to have a studio here at home and to be able to collaborate with so many great musicians. And you can pre-order the release now. There'll be four songs in total. There's Let's Change the World. There's a song called Just the Way, which is a reggae song that Ringo wrote with Bruce Sugar, his co-producer, a song called Coming Undone with Linda Perry, former lead singer of Four Non-Blondes, and his cover of Rock Around the Clock, 
will also be on there. So Ringo continuing to be busy. Uh, Danny Harrison shared the good news of the success of the new All Things Must Pass around the world with global stats. The album reached either number one or top 10 status on different charts in the US, UK, Sweden, Germany, Switzerland, France, Australia, Belgium, and the Netherlands. We can also be very excited to tell you that All Things Must Pass is in fact re-entering Billboard's top 200 album charts at number seven for the week of August 21st. And it's the number one album on Billboard's rock album charts. So this year of 2021, both George and Paul have scored number one albums on the rock album charts. Paul with McCartney 3 and McCartney 3 Imagined. Danny has teamed up with floral artist Ruth Davis to make a special art installation in the center of London that recreates all things must pass his iconic albums cover art. A video was just released that explains how the giant gnome garden came together with Davis creating larger than life figures based on two of the gnomes using different plant materials. The gnomes sit on a large uh, circle of turf centered on an oversized stool and a pair of boots to represent George. Okay, um, a few more things. Paul McCartney was a guest on Mick Ronson's music series on Apple TV called Watch the Sound. And there is a song that he contributed to from that series that you can now hear on YouTube. It's called I Know Time Is Calling with the artist listed as Mark Ronson featuring Paul McCartney and Gary Newman. <laughs> Remember Gary Newman of Cars fame? And Gary sings the lead vocals and Paul plays the synthesizer part. Um, also, the Beatles Cirque du Soleil show Love returns to the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas this Thursday. Since opening to rave reviews on June 30th, 2006, Love has been performed to over 10 million audience members and has won three Grammy Awards. Just a couple of passings I want to make note of. First of all, of course, there is the music legend of Don Everly, one half of the Everly Brothers. The Everlys were a massive influence on the Beatles. And in fact, uh, Paul McCartney said um, that when he and John first started writing songs, I was Phil and he was Don. According to Mark Lewis's book, The Beatles Live, the group used to perform the Everlys' number one hit, Kathy's Clown, the year that the song was a hit in 1960. The following year, the Beatles covered their song, the Everly song, So How Come No One Loves Me, which they also recorded for BBC Radio. Paul McCartney made reference to the brothers in the lyrics of the Wings hit Let Him In when he sang the names Phil and Don. And in 1984, Paul helped the duo out for their comeback album, EB84, by writing a song that was tailor-made for them for their wonderful harmonies on the wings of a nightingale. Dave Edmonds produced the song and their album. And let us not forget that George Harrison covered the Everly's first big hit, Bye Bye Love, for his Dark Horse album, and a song that was a hit for the Everly's and others, Let It Be Me, which appeared on the compilation Early Takes Volume 1. Phil Everly died. Phil Everly died in 2014. And now, sadly, both brothers are gone. Don Everly was 84. Finally, we also mourn the loss of country music legend Tom T. Hall, who is best known for having written the song Harper Valley PTA, which was a number one hit for Jeannie C. Riley in 1968. Hall had many country hits and one that crossed over into the pop charts in 1973 called I Love. His connection in the Beatle world is that he sang with Johnny Cash and Paul McCartney for their collaboration of New Moon Over Jamaica which appeared on Cash's album, Water from the Wells of Home, in 1988. All three of them ended up sharing the songwriting credit for that song. Tom T. Hall was 85. And finally, let's wish a very happy 70th birthday today to Mark Hudson, known among Beale fans for his fine work with Ringo, co-producing albums like Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, Choose Love, I Want to Be Santa Claus, also spending many years in the Hudson Brothers and producing acts like Aerosmith, Ozzy Osbourne, and Hanson. And there you go. That's all the Beatle news that we have this time out. I think that was plenty. I actually cut it in half. There was that <laughs> much it, news. What's what, that? Wasn't it Tom T. Hall who gave us the children's favorite, Sneaky Snake? 
I'm not quite sure. You might be the Tom T. Hall expert amongst us. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But I do remember I Love. That was a top 20 hit. Used to hear that all the time on the radio. Good song. Anyway, so as I said earlier, we have Jason Krupa and Ken Womack as our special guest. They have a brand new book out called All Things Must Pass Away. Harrison Clapton and other assorted love songs talking about the relationship between the two musical and guitar giants. I want to start off the conversation by asking the two of you, first of all, I think it's really important that you established um, the differences in George's and Eric's family background and their upbringing and seeing the differences between the two, which helps you to understand why Eric found it difficult to commit to bands for any length of time. George, however, was much more grounded and he continued to stay in the Beatles until their breakup. My question to start this conversation off is how did their relationship with each other beyond supporting each other's music help them to fully discover themselves and what they wanted with their careers coming at a crossroads, no pun intended there, um, (laughs) with uh, (laughs) All Things Must Pass coming out and Layla um, with those two tremendous albums. Mm. I think from, from George's perspective in a very real way, it was, it was, it was just the support having somebody there that he had a rapport with. Um, You know, we talk about the importance of bonding on that Delaney and Bonnie tour in December of 69. And they would, they would sort of see each other in sessions and George would obviously invite Eric to sessions he was working on. And, once he's working on all things must pass, having his support, having somebody who's sympathetic, who he knows he can rely on uh, was very important to him. And he, he came out of the Beatles with a sense, uh, I think of, you know, are these songs any good? Um, And having people like Clapton and Ringo and Klaus Foreman um, helped him sort of have the courage to step forward and and do these songs with, with confidence. For Clapton, you know, there's it's also just a, some of it's very prosaic in the sense that George invites him to be part of these sessions and Bill, Bobby Whitlock is there and then Carl Regal shows up and Jim Gordon shows up and they have a band. And so they physically are in this space working with each other as their band is coming together. And and then he gives them studio time. So, the, you know, he's, he's sort of helping them to, to forge this group in the middle of, of his recording sessions. Um, and, the, you know, this is beyond all of just the, you know, the friendship aspect and how they had, how they had developed this relationship over the past several years. Hmm. Well, when, when it comes to George, and this is just my interpretation from all the things that you said through the years, I think that George kind of knew what he wanted in, in life. And I think that he wanted to be in a band where he was, and equal with everybody else. I think he was far more comfortable with the traveling Wilburys approach more so than being in the Beatles. Um, He never wanted to be the front guy. He was very happy with John and Paul kind of leading the way, but he was also frustrated towards the end as he was flourishing as a songwriter and he wasn't getting more of the songs in there. So I think he kind of knew where he stood with what he wanted out of music. And it just came pouring out of him with so many years of build up with all these songs with all things was passed. But with Eric Clapton, wasn't there some kind of an identity crisis with him? Because uh, sure. And, and you can see that in Eric's early years. And, and we, we really toyed with the idea of not including that analysis, but the further along we got with the project, we realized it was integral to trying to understand these guys who were very different people and, and do hail from, different, uh, particularly youthful experiences. But when, when it comes to Eric, you know, he does give George this sense of confidence that's mm-hmm. very important because George has spent a lot of time sublimating his ego uh, in really tremendous ways. And it it's very important to remember, too, that back in Hamburg, remember George was getting his fair share of lead vocals. And uh, right. that disappeared when he wasn't... Uh, 
a member of that, that made a big difference. But uh, understanding their differences really comes down to that word that just that uh, Jason shared a moment ago, which is confidence. You know, Eric had plenty of confidence to quit bands uh, in, in legendary fashion, but it was related to ego. And here's this other guy who is just amazing at sublimating his. Mm, very interesting. And you could also point to George working with Bob Dylan at the same time. That must have been that must have helped his ego a bit and being with Delaney and Bonnie and all the other people that he was producing for Apple. So I think all that contributed to gaining more confidence in himself at the same time. For sure. And it, it's not like, you know, it's not, he was certainly confident, but I think, you know, and he, he talks about this specifically in reference to I'd have you any time where uh, we, we talk about this in the book where he's, he's thinking, you know, are these songs any good? He just, he, the word he uses is fruity. These songs are all fruity. And, and he talks about, you know, having Clapton, he's co-written the song with Dylan and he's got Clapton playing lead guitar on it. And so this helps him sort of say, okay, I can, you know, these are good songs. And he, he talks about how he was surprised that people responded sympathetically when he had found so much resistance or disinterest, you know, in a lot of cases with the Beatles. Um, he talks about them not getting a song very quickly, which to him was, you know, a reason to abandon something and move on to the next whatever. Yeah. Song. How do you interpret? Because so many people have talked about this, the the get back, let it be sessions where George is, is bringing out, you know, all these different songs, the title track to all things must pass and and wah wah and hear me, Lord. And the Beatles don't go. They don't go full throttle with those songs, although they, they did rehearse all things was passed quite a lot. But for some reason, they decided right. not to continue to, to do their own versions as a band with them. How do how... I, I think it's related to I mean, there's that quote from George and I think March 1970 in, a, in an interview where he says he talks about them not getting the songs, not understanding them. And I think it's a combination of a lack of patience and also realizing that they weren't going to spend a lot of time on his songs. He had they had a history of sort of given him, you know, a day maybe. Mm. And, and uh, you know, so he thought, well, they're not going to get this. Also, he was sort of creating his own little world. You know, people like to say, well, oh, you know, these songs could have been on Beatle albums, but they, that's not who the Beatles were. You know, the Beatles weren't the band that, were, that was going to do Isn't It a Pity and Art of Dying in 1966, 67, you know. They, that while they, I mean, you can disagree with that, but I, I think, as broad a canvas as they covered, he was still creating something outside of that that was very, very personal. And in order for them to do that, they would have had they would have had to take more time to to sort of understand where George was coming from. Certainly, they could have done it. You know, it was not outside of the realm of their abilities, but they were. You know, George Martin and John and Paul were concentrated on Lennon McCartney songs. Yeah. That's what got the most energy. And that was the politics so, of that band right there. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, and he knew yeah, I have an audio clip of George Martin staying. And it's so hard for me to believe he even thought this way. The first time that George Harrison really knocked him out with one of his songs was here comes the sun. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that late in the game. But uh, it, it's incredible. I think Alan might, might uh, have something to say about, Art of Dying and whether or not the Beatles could have done it in 1966. We talked about that in our last show, but I agree with you, Jason. Uh, I've said on, on this show and, and probably on Talk More Talk that um, I couldn't see John and Paul playing on the All Things Must Pass album for most of those songs, just like I couldn't see uh, you know, Paul and George on the Plastic Ono Band album. <laughs> you know, yeah. They really were drifting apart musically in many ways. Um, before I pass you over to Alan, well, one of the things I wanted to bring up, which I think is really important, and I think you do this in all your interviews, I found it really interesting that George had in mind to have a backup band at Apple for their artists, very much like in the vein of Motown, which was a very cool idea. And when you, when you take a look at all the Apple artists, George was more vested in them than any of the Beatles. He did really more in was. terms of pr in production and in songwriting and everything. He really was into the whole idea. And if they had a backup band, 
with some of these great musicians, whether it's Klaus Vormann, Peter Frampton, whoever it was that George had in mind, they could have cranked out a lot more material. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, George was, he was taking a leadership role with Apple uh, in a moment when everybody else was sort of in retreat and keeping that dream, gr that dream alive. The, uh, it, and I don't think I've had a chance to share this with Jason yet. I spoke last week with a fellow who's on the Imagine album, Rod Linton, uh, mm -hmm. who plays acoustic guitar, I believe, on four of those songs. Um, and uh, Rod uh, felt like he was being approached about being in this Apple House band, too. So it was a, it was an idea that was in the ether at the time. Um, and it, it just shows you the kind of creative and generous approach that George Harrison was taking to that, that idea. In fact, generosity to me is is one of the key words when we think about all things must pass, right? Um, this allowing of folks to grab a guitar, maybe one of Alan's back there, you know, grab a guitar and <laughs> and uh, step up and be part of the track. We'll see where it goes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very much so. All right, Alan, it's your turn. Um, you know, there's there was. We were just talking about um, Clapton's uh, propensity for leaving bands. Um, and it's not exactly in the book explicitly, but it kind of is between a lot of the lines that um, he was actually that way with his romantic relationships too, including with Patty. Um, you know, once he finally married Patty, uh, that, didn't have long for this world. Uh, you know, he probably was pining after her longer than he was actually married to her. Oh, um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, and it, it sure is a tragedy. You know, so much of our culture, at least our, our rock music, classic rock culture has looked at this as this great star crossed romance, which of course is how Eric set it up mm -hmm. by, by, you know, aping, you know, the, the ancient poem, but <laughs> It really does break your heart when you you see that he's allegedly pined for, as you said, for all these years, and then he gets together with her, and he has a fusillade of affairs. You know, and it yeah. it, it just begs the question of you know uh, I, I, the magnificence of this love, right? Uh, it, it was worth so much that very little work was done to preserve it. I, mean, I also we, think, you, go go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to no, say, we're interviewing you. <laughs> well, well, okay, sure. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, not that I really have anything to contribute here, but no. Um, the, you know, the, the fact that he, he doesn't necessarily apply this specifically to Patty at first, this whole story of Layla, that it's actually the second relationship. And he's, you know, he's, you know, it's, it's almost like he's looking for something to fit this frame. And, and, you know, this is what it's rested on, but it's a much more complicated story than that. You know, there's, a, like you say, he, he does seem to lack the stability of being able to stay, not just in bands, but in relationships. And, it, you know, as we talk about all this early history stuff, that's, that's part of his unstable upbringing. You know, he, he sort of creates instability where, where, you know, there might otherwise have been stability. Um, There's that beautiful so. moment, right? Where when they first meet, Eric loves talking guitars with George. George sees a lonely guy who needs a friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a, such a revealing response. He could see through people. Yeah. yeah. Do you think um, that the, I just want to just bounce off the thing with, with Patty. Was there a real love that you, think he felt for her or was it more of a conquest i love her quote right where she says that uh you know uh george was probably her soulmate and she blew it and that eric was just a playmate hmm. yeah pretty accurate. i mean we we characterize it as a trauma bond you know to use current psychological therapeutic language um but, you know, I think a lot of people have trauma bonds and a lot of people characterize that as love. So that's a much deeper conversation than we have time to get into. But I think, um, you know, obviously there is some emotional attraction, there's physical attraction. Um, where that crosses the line into being something that's unstable and, and impossible to maintain is, you know, it's an individual thing. I think clearly with these two people, 
looking at their history, it was not going to be possible to maintain this relationship. But we can see that in retrospect. We can't, you know, when you're yeah. in it, you can't, you can't yeah. know that. There's, there's mm. another thing you say that, that uh, you may have been quoting Patty um, or, or even paraphrasing her, but um, there was at one point in the book uh, section where uh, you say that it, it, it wasn't so much that he even wanted Patty. He wanted George's life. I think maybe Patty does say that uh, and everything about it. And that included Patty. Um, yeah. And, you know, may have been confused by the fact that Patty was incredibly gorgeous. Hmm. Um, uh, what I have always sort of wondered about is, is how George and Eric managed to maintain the friendship that they had through all of that, you know? I mean, I, I'm not sure uh, I know anybody who, if, you know, their best friend was really, really pining for their wife, um, would have maintained that friendship in the way that George and Eric did. I mean, it, it was a professional friendship, but it was also a really a friendship where they were always there for each other. I mean, even as late as 91, when, you know, Eric put his band together at George's disposal to tour Japan. Um, you know, I, I have an answer for that. And I don't think it's a pretty one. Um, frankly, you know, part of the issue here is, is I, I think it's slightly misogynist on both of their parts mm. and the way after years of touring already under their belts, when that friendship really starts churning and, and Eric is spending so much time with George and Patty, I, I think they saw, you know, sexual relationships as being disposable, hmm. you know, and a commodity. Uh, and they, they weren't letting something like that get in the way of, of their, you know, their masculine friendship connection. And I don't know, Eric, uh, sorry, Eric, also known as Jason. Jason, if you, <laughs> it's actually the Eric of our friendship. So. I'm, Derek is Eric. No, I'm, yeah. Uh, um, I don't. I don't know how you you compare me to Eric. <laughs> I'm not sure. I I <laughs> that, that's for. A, I'll call you later. That's part of our okay. trauma bond. Oh, thanks. That's our thanks trauma bond. Okay, we'll take we'll take that offline. What what was I supposed to say now? <laughs> Just the some... that kind of misogynist quality and that approach to relationships with women. There's a kind of disposable. Oh yeah, absolutely. And as much as you know, they they made sort of reference the whole free love idea. I think there's something, there is something very misogynistic about this. Like women were, were possessions, you know, um, as forward thinking as George could, could be, I think that's one area where he was not necessarily uh, very progressive, you know, asking Patty to, to give up modeling and, you know, basically wanting her to be kind of a little, not necessarily housewife, but, but not have a necessarily a career of her own on that level you know at a, at a more critical question alan could even be the fact that george has an affair with you mm -hmm. know mrs starkey <laughs> right i mean you know and and their friendship uh seemed to be pretty solid uh and unerring it's just uh, i think it's a, a misogynist uh viewpoint Interesting. What, what did John Lennon used to say about their tours? It was uh, Satyricon. <laughs> yeah, Satyricon. Right. It was Satyricon. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think they had diminished, and I, I don't like this word, and particularly to use it in front of a, a great psychotherapist like my colleague, Eric Clapton. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's almost, uh, gosh, the way they approach that is, uh, it, it is, it's disposability. They're over those petty normal jealousies that we might have. Yeah, it's funny though that you know it, the way Eric was casting it was not as a, a, a sexual conquest so much as you know this great great love that has that mirrors this antique story. You know, <laughs> it, it was it was it, it was just uh, you know romantic with a capital R. Um, but I guess when it really came down to it, it wasn't. No. You know. Um, there's one other um, interesting statistic I think you guys might be um, 
interested to hear. Uh, I added up all of the times um, spent on various things during the Let It Be sessions, and exactly the same amount of time was spent on All Things Must Pass as on Maxwell's Silver Hammer. <laughs> now, if you had said that to George, he wouldn't believe it, I don't think. But, um, no. but it turns out that, you know, like pretty much to the minute, the same amount of time. <laughs> wow. Hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure Maxwell Silverhammer took a greater psychic toll on him than uh, <laughs> part of <laughs> all things. You know, pass. <laughs> it's a little known fact that uh, if all things must pass had had an anvil part, <laughs> it's on Abbey road. I mean, right. It's a QN. That's right. Um, I, I wonder why they never cottoned on to that one, though. Do you think it was the, uh, the, the sort of religious aspect? I mean, of, of all of George's things, uh, even his Indian things within the Beatles, with the conceivable exception of Within You, Without You, he never he, he got into the Indian sound, but he never really got into the philosophical stuff in his Beatles things. Um, do you think that that put them off? You know, that it, it, all things must pass and hear me, Lord, certainly. I, I mean, I that's hard to say. It's. Uh, you know, they weren't connecting from his point of view, I think they they just were not. For whatever reason, and you can kind of hear it in the tapes they never really seem to be very enthusiastic about that song. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's very frustrating to hear that because they all, it, it seems like it's, it's about to gel. It's about to turn into a cohesive take and then it kind of falls apart mm-hmm. over and over and over again, um, which had to be very frustrating. And, you know, was that disinterest? Was that just sort of general lethargy from, being at Twickenham, being tired after the White Album, being John Lennon on heroin. I mean, what, you know, how many factors are at play here that are, that really don't have anything to do specifically with the music? Um, it was that so inability I'm, for them to hear him. Well, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I think in a broad, a broader sense, sure, that's, that's true. I just don't know specifically that song. I mean, because Alan White, you know, when I, when I interviewed him about this, he, he, he said, you know, with a song that good, it was easy to play on it. So he, you know, he saw the quality of that song immediately. Mm. And obviously the other people on the, you know, they were playing on the session saw it too. I guess for the Beatles, it was easier for them to relate to For You Blue <laughs> than it was All Things Must Pass. So. Yeah. Right, right. Alan, what were you going to say about uh, Art of Dying? I'm, I'm curious about this. Oh, well, last, last week when we were or, Two weeks ago, when we were talking about the reissue, uh, Ken had said what you said about uh, how it couldn't have fit into Revolver. And it sort of had occurred to me that she said, she said, I know what it's like to be dead. And uh, uh, tomorrow never knows, you know, turn off your mind, relax and float downstream in its connection with the Tibetan Book of the Dead. That that perhaps with all of this sort of death stuff in the air, I mean, Eleanor Rigby, yeah, right. you know, uh, that maybe it could have fit, you know, I don't know if it could have fit musically, but it, it, we don't know what they would have done with it in 1966. Um, so, but, but it, maybe it could have, you know, it was in the air. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't think it was outside of the, of what they were thinking because they were all reading a lot of different interesting material, certainly, mm-hmm. but, you know, he, we, I, I mentioned, we mentioned this in the book that, um, you know, he already had three songs on an album, so it wasn't like he was getting it a fourth. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, yeah. that was probably the, maybe the fourth one he suggested. And like, no, you know, you've already got three, George. And I guess the one last thing I want to ask before I turn you over to Darren is um, it's, it's clear in the book that George blew hot and cold over Spectre's production. I mean, you pretty much show that the first time he heard what Spectre was doing, he really didn't like it. And then he got used to it. And then, as we know, in 2000, 2001, when he was working on remastering it, he said, you know, it's a bit too much. Um, so uh, it, it just strikes me as an interesting thing because it's now a current topic because of the remix. You know, people who were defending the Spectre 
you know, someone put on a, a note on our last show saying that, well, you know, but George didn't mention in his liner notes for the 2000 reissue uh, that he didn't like Spectre. But the thing is, he did mention it in interviews. And I hadn't known in, until I read the book that that he had was had doubts about it even while they were recording. Um, yeah, I mean, the it's the the whole term despectorization is is uh, raises raises a flag for me because it's so misunderstood. I think most people associate it with lots of reverb, and so it comes down to you know art of dying, waiting on you all, you know, wah wah, these big cavernous sounds, and so they think, well, you strip away all that reverb, and then you you sort of despectorize everything, and. To Spectre is, you know, as you say, from the first first session is running the show. He's got a studio full of musicians, maybe as many as 12 people. And and he carries on with that for the first, at least the first few sessions. And he's running things sort of like he did at Gold Star. And that's his technique. That's how, you know, that's how he ran Instant Karma that George saw firsthand. Hmm. And, and he responded to it fav- favorably. So... I think to some extent he maybe knew a little bit of what he was getting into, but he didn't know it was going to sound, you know, the difference between playing in the studio and then coming into the control room and hearing this sound, um, which, you know, Chris Thomas talked about it being this just overwhelming experience of of hearing this and, and Klaus, you know, talked about it being just incredibly loud. You know, he, he wants to impress you with this, with the force of what he's done. So, you know, that's in the tracking and that's, they're recording on eight track. They're probably not recording eight tracks at one go. So if you have a dozen people in the studio, you're doubling up tracks, you're tripling tracks. So you're not going to unmix that. You're not going to take out three pianos. You're not going to take out the five guitars. You know, those are all mixed together. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of Spectre's production that is pretty much burnt into the tapes. And as far as uh, John Leckie, one of the engineers, second engineer on the album, said they would not have really recorded effects to tape that much. So you can take the, the reverb out necessarily or the, the tape echo, um, but the instruments are where they are. They're in the sound of those instruments, sort of generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, we get to the, the, the next aspect with overdubs where George is, you know, multi-tracking his voice dozens of times on My Sweet Lord and adding guitars and doing this on various songs. And then directing John Barham on the string and, and orchestral arrangements. And Spectre is not part of that. So that's an aspect of the production that's very much George. You know, he's he's running the show at this point. And Spectre has left because of his drinking um, after the tracking sessions, but before they really get into the or, you know, into the the sort of the last leg of recording. Um, then he comes back and he's giving in, input on mixing and Ken Scott and George are really running that. They take some notes and other notes they don't. But I think his spirit is sort of hovering over that process. And so that, you know, is something you could unmix. And it, I think it's I don't think I've ever seen George in an interview or Danny in an interview use the term despectorization. They no. talk about remixing and they talk about reverb. Um but yeah, you know, I think we also have to look at context. The same year, a huge, huge number one hit called Bridge Over Troubled Water has pretty cavernous reverb at the end, as does the boxer. I mean, it's just this that that percussion hit in the boxer at the end is just, you know, it's meant to sound massive. So it's not like it was an anomaly. It's not like they were doing this and it and it sounded, you know, totally different. Um, I think it, I think it was part of the idea of what it could sound like at that time mm-hmm. um and i you know i don't know that george necessarily thought that you know after they did wah wah and he goes and listens to it that it's going to sound like that obviously he's surprised and he talks about how much he hated it um and it, but then he grew to like it but he also you know i think he also as we talk about the sort of this middle part of the sessions where he's doing these acoustic songs those are not so much specter style productions right. those mm-hmm. are you know, they he would overdub more more acoustic guitars after that, but it wasn't this sort of massive casting. 
characters like each start of the sessions with. So I think there's some give and take, there's some flow mm -hmm. in how those sessions will run. Right. And the only hey. thing I could add is as soon as we're done, I'm going to go onto the OED. And, <laughs> uh, I'm going to see when has specterized or despecterized entered the language officially like Joycean. <laughs> um, <laughs> I keep threatening to write an article about the myth of despectorization and maybe I'll do it this week. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. But still, in the George had the final say in everything. Yeah. So he did approve it the way that it went out. Was there a deadline that he absolutely had to meet? Could he have made changes at the last minute if he wanted to? Uh, I think he pushed the deadline because he, you know, Spectre and in, in, in that interview uh, Scorsese did with him, is, you know, he sort of suggested he didn't want to finish the album because he kept changing his mind and he kept saying, well, the mastering is not good enough. And he, so they went to three studios to master it uh, and had George Peckham come over from Apple to three to studios in two countries. <laughs> yes. In two countries. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, I think, I think he could release it whenever he wanted to. He had, you know, control over this. Um, and it was, I think he was, he was, to me, he was worrying over every little detail. You know, he wanted the, the overdubs to be right. He wanted the, uh, you know, the mastering to be right. He, he, you know, is he going to do two albums or is he going to do three? You know, these are all things that he's still sort of figuring out as he's, as he, he's in the end of this process. Right. I think when people talk about the Phil Spector sound, I think they're, uh, at least to me, I think they're referring to the wall of sound and all yes. these different instruments, you know, so much instrumentation. Uh, maybe not as much talking about reverb, at least that's, right, that's how I, mean, I interpret. But the wall of sound, of course, is a signal going through the echo chamber. I mean, it's really, right, mm. Jason? It's <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a combination of, you know, having the, all those instruments stacked up, but what really blends it all together is, is, you know, how they're, how they're managing the tape echo. John, like he talked about how he learned so much about, um, or maybe it's Chris Thomas, I'm forgetting who the quote's from now, where he talked about, you know, several guitars sounding like one big guitar, one big sound, you know, and that's done, that's not just sticking a bunch of mics up and mixing them all to one track, they're, they're processing that together. So I, I mean, I, I think you're right in that sense, the, the, um, the wall, the wall of sound is processing, but it's also how he builds the track with, you know, with instrumentalists. Hmm. Um, but a lot of the conversation though I've seen online uh, over the years and in articles is, is in reference to songs like art of dying and, and, you know, awaiting on you all and, Wah wah, which are you know they do stand out as these sort of big echoey uh, right. productions, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, he, they there are a lot of people on "Isn't the Pity." There are a lot of people on "My Sweet Lord." You know, those songs don't necessarily sound uh, like those other songs. So you know, it, it could be that 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 is sort of built into the way Spectre constructed those arrangements or constructed the recording from from what George was arranging in the studio. Okay. So Darren is champing at the bit and we <laughs> just let him uh, have a chance. So. I wanted to swing it back to, to George and Eric. And one thing that I, I find fascinating about the, their relationship is that they could very easily have been two individuals who, who, uh, who were pitted against each other. Here you had uh, George Harrison, who was in the biggest band in the world. And Clapton, we've already alluded to and talked about how he went from band to band. And, you know, um, there was no stability there, whether or not, regardless of whether Clap uh, Clapton was responsible for that, was looking for that, irregardless. Here he, he, he hit it off with a friend who had that one rock solid foundation, which happened to be the biggest band in the world. Uh, on the other side of the coin, you don't tend to hear too much praise about George Harrison, the guitarist, at least not at that point, whereas Clapton already had been, it had been declared that he was God. So here you had this, this iconic musician uh, befriending uh, a great guitarist who was in this iconic band. Uh, that sounds like where I come from, friction and... Uh, J 
jealousy and egos. And while that might have existed, it didn't stop the two of them from becoming like brothers. Something we haven't touched on yet was drugs. And in your book, I think it's Klaus Vorman who points out that in that window in 1970, where uh, they're, they're recording all things must pass. George is relatively sober at this point. Uh, and that's not to say that George didn't have his moments before and after, but at this point, 1970, leading into 71, George was, let's say, relatively sober and clean. We know that that's not the case with Clapton. In fact, Clapton, who may have been in bad shape in 70, was heading towards even you know, um, uh, was there a point where the friendship where, where, where George felt the responsibility to help his friend on that, in that area? Um, or was it the type of friendship where they, when it came to that, it, those issues, uh, they were hands off with each other? I see it as George's just innate sense of generosity and Patty's too, the way they helped shepherd him through Bangladesh uh, in 1971 and you know, make it possible for him to take advantage of that opportunity, even though he has just, as you said, gone off a, a massive cliff. You know, uh, he is he is worse than he was in 1970. Yeah. And part of that, that worseness, which I don't think is a word, but maybe it is, worstosity, uh, comes from uh, from that Derek and the Domino's tour, right? Where those guys just do everything possible to destroy themselves and do. Uh, but I see, I see George as being generous of spirit, just as he was when he first met him and wanting to help him. And that seems to be his first, that his first impulse, even though by then, you know, Eric has made his kind of pathetic, uh, you know, uh, outreach to Patty in front of George. Uh, right. I think it just says a lot about George. I don't know. What do you think, Jason? I, well, I also think, you know, if we can't look at this necessarily like we look at drugs from today's point of view, because the understanding about what drugs do to, to our minds and our bodies is much different. Um, and the, and the co whole concept of rehab and what that means. And, you know, Clapton was attempting in, in, not a very effective way to to break himself free of this. He knew he needed to break free of it. So I, I think it's, you know, there's not like this sense that he's just carrying on and not thinking that this isn't having an effect. Um, and I, you know, I think George must have been aware of that somehow. But, you know, then what resources are available? What is what do you do? You know, you're even now, if you have a friend who's deep in the throes of addiction, how do you handle that? You know, do you, do you have an intervention? You know, is that going to be successful? Um, could it have been successful then? Were, were the, re, the mental health resources available in 1970 or 71 to, you know, for George to be able to pull in, in, into something like that? You know, I don't, I don't think from what I understand about mental health resources in Britain at the time, I don't really think that something like that was, was as widespread and certainly not understood. I mean, even even hallucinogens were not very well understood. It was all it was all very spoken of in in kind of you know nebulous terms and and spiritual terms. You know, those the idea of drugs and spirituality getting kind of mixed up to the detriment of both. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's getting to the to the sessions and playing together. Um, it's, all Things Must Pass is inf infamous for being uh, not very well documented and who played what, when, and where. And um, do we have a sense uh, of the dynamic of the two of them as guitarists, the percentage of guitar that we hear on All Things Must Pass, how much of it is George, how much of it is, is Eric, how much of it is Peter Frampton or maybe Dave Mason or someone else who was uh, on the periphery? of those sessions. I do realize I just completely jumped topics, but at that just popped <laughs> into my head about, you know, what was going on within the studio and here's this unique friendship. This is George Harrison's album, but how much 
you know, opportunity to play did George give to his friend Eric on but, his album? I mean, I mean, George says, you know, Eric is the first note you hear, the first guitar note on and, uh, I'd Have You Any Time. So I think, you know, he was not, I, you know, we talk about George as a guitarist, but I think more than that, he was a recording artist. And he was constructing these these songs and these arrangements with sort of that Beatles recording artist mentality in mind. It wasn't like, oh, I've written the song, I get to play this cool solo on it. You know, it's it's he's he's written these songs and he wants to find the best arrangement and the best players. And I, you know, I think Clapton is is lead guitar in a lot of these songs. The slide guitars are, you know, predominantly George. I think that's pretty distinctive. You can hear that. Um, there may be instances where maybe Clapton is playing. Again, it's unclear exactly, but um, I would think that the sort of the obvious electric guitar lead lines that you would expect to be Clapton um, would be him. Although, you know, George is playing the, the lead line on What Is Life. That's why on the rough mix, rough, rough take, first take, he can't sing and play that riff. So he just he just sort of gets the introductory word to each verse, uh, and then keeps on keeps on playing. So there are some crossover for sure, but um, I mean, I, I think I haven't gone through and made a list and said here's what I think you know each of them plays on. But I you know it seems Clapton's playing is pretty distinctive. Mm-hmm. Um, and George, we would get the highest distinctive. percentage then if we were <laughs> if we were assigning percentages, right? Yeah, probably so. Hmm. Well, on that very subject, <laughs> there are times when I find it hard to figure out whether it's George or Eric on certain songs. And I want to ask you about two in particular, because correct me if I'm wrong here. I think you say in the book that Clapton played lead guitar on Beware of Darkness. I believe I believe so, although there are so many guitars on that track. Um, and it's mostly a live track that they could both have been playing guitar. Because it sounds so much like George. And I've yeah. always thought it was George. But on one of the pages, it does say in the final mix, I believe I, it says that in the book that that was Clapton. And Clapton play lead on Wawa, which I thought was George. Yeah, well, there are, again, several guitars on that. Uh, Clapton's playing the Wawa. Um, I believe it was John Lecky who confirmed that for me. He had a memory of that, or maybe maybe it was Alan White. Um, but again, you know, it's several it's several guitars, and so they're obviously both playing on it. And that's a, an electric guitar song. So uh, I I tend to lean toward Clapton just because of, of other people telling me that we're at the sessions. But you know, if there's evidence that contradicts that then I'm happy to take it. I sure hope there's a day we get to the bottom of every single <laughs> song and we know who played what. I mean, and it's really a crime. There was no cameras going on at that time. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. there, there, you know, it's, it was such a, such a loose series of sessions in, in the sense that, it, it, you know, Ken got this quote from Alan Parsons. If, if somebody showed up, George would hand them a guitar and say, you know, go and play. You know, it's, it, they weren't writing that down. Anybody could be drifting through. Hmm. And also based on what I've been hearing from various interviews, Peter Frampton only played acoustic guitar during these right. sessions. Right. And uh, behind that locked door, I think, and I live for you. I think yeah, he, he's on there. He came in in that, that acoustic week with, uh, if not for you and, and uh, behind that locked door and I, hmm. I live for you. Okay. And then he came back and he did some overdubs where they wanted more. And I suspect that was on If Not For You. You can hear the rough mixes If Not For You sound, sound a little less layered than the, than the final mix. So there are a lot of acoustic guitars on that final mix. Mm. Of course, how do you know if that's not Badfinger, too? Well, <laughs> they were on tour. so Oh, by uh, that point, they were. By okay. that point, yeah. They, and all, although they may have come back, two of them may have come back for... I think a session on June 26th. I just got this the other day from somebody. Um, but yeah, by and large, after about the fifth or so, they were they were on tour. Okay. Also, I wanted to bring up, you say that um, 
George redid Art of Dying from how Spectre produced it originally. So do you have any idea what the original version sounded like? Yeah, it's on Was bootleg. It? And it, it's, it, to me, it sounds like, uh, it, I, I say this in the book, it sounds like a minor key version of Be My Baby. It has, the, it has the, all the hallmarks <laughs> of the Spectre, the classic Spectre wall of sound sound it has the acoustic guitarist creating the drone in the background and then the the drum you know uh the drum sound and then the the pianos and just the way everything is arranged and i, I mean i think george was certainly a big part of that because you hear him on take one in the box where he's directing hmm. you know but I, I think specter built on that and it it just feels like if he had been able to go on and continue that he that would have been another sort of you know a wawa or a, you know, very, very Spectre-ish hmm. production. Yeah. Do you know what bootleg that was on? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I may have it and I haven't um, listened to it for a while. So. I don't, I don't remember. I, <laughs> I had a, I had a collection that somebody had put together. Not that we listened to bootlegs, God forbid. Hmm. Um, that somebody put together with all of the outtakes from these sessions. I think mean, it was six, six discs in total. And, and so that's what we used for, for reference for this book. Hmm. Do you have any insight as far as what was chosen for for the new release in the box set? Because there's one song that stems from that time called I'll Still Love You, which George gave to Ringo for his album Ringo's Rotogravure. And it's from that time period. And there are rehearsals of that. So would you have any idea at all why that wasn't included? Any of you have any I don't. information maybe about that? Okay. Um, can you talk about the importance of John Barham scoring? What a big part that played. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, I mean, as you see in the in papers of the book, he sent us yeah. scans of uh, My Sweet Lord and Isn't It a Pity. And uh, he was there from the very beginning. George, even before sessions began, George brought him to Friar Park. And they'd, of course, worked together before. Um, he brought him to Fire, Friar Park and played mm. through the songs on acoustic guitar. And um, and he, you know, he said, in retrospect, I just think George wanted to get my impression and, and to get a sense of what these songs were as he was about to go into the studio. And then he had him there from the first session to the last, uh, sometimes wow. playing playing on uh, uh, playing keyboard, playing piano or harmonium or something. Um, so he's he's deeply involved in this, and and then he goes away and writes the the scores based on George's suggestions. He said George would sing the melody line and, or play it, and then John would write the uh, the inner voicings for the instruments. Mm, just gorgeous. Yeah, I thought and, also, I'm sorry. In the case of Isn't It a Pity, I remember hearing that George had hummed. He knew what. What he wanted the um, the instrumental to sound like that part the da 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 da, da. so he knew that ahead yeah. of time right yeah and that's in his demo from early early on right sixty nine demo so he had that in his mind um, but the thing that you'll see in the in that that page two pages of the score that that we have in the book is that there's a whole section of woodwinds and brass that are not really audible on the final mix and uh, Barham couldn't remember if they had just not recorded that or if it was just mixed so low that, that you can't hear it, uh, which I thought was, and, and that would have been the biggest arrangement on the album, possibly as many as 29 players. <laughs> and the strings would have been recorded separately and then the brass and woodwinds would have been recorded, you know, mm. separately on their own track uh, just to control the sound. But um, for the podcast, uh, uh, producing the Beatles, I, I asked, a composer in UK to recreate these two scores using uh, high-end digital samples. So soon I'll be doing an episode each on these songs and you'll be able to hear what these scores sound like in isolation, including that section of Isn't It a Pity that isn't really audible on the final record, which is nice. fascinating. It's, it's just, it's incredible that all these layers are in there. Um, it's it's just a, it's a richly richly layered album. I mean, it, that seems like an obvious thing to say, but once you start peeling the layers apart, it's like, oh my god, this is here, really. It would be nice to hear his scoring isolated. Yeah, you know the way that they that they have done with George Martin stuff on the Beatles right. box set. Right. Would yeah, it would have been. It, I'm sorry. Been, 
it would have been nice. Yeah, it would have been nice if they would have included some of that on this box set. I agree. Hmm. Was that all put on one track? The scoring? I think some of it, because, you know, if you're doing woodwinds and you're doing strings, it would have been on two tracks. But I think a hmm. lot of it probably was on one track. Okay. Would you say not that these two or two things are related, but would you say that um, that type of layering uh, was also comparable to what they did with the Layla album with the guitars? Uh, that there's so many guitars buried in there uh, between Eric and Dwayne Allman uh, that some of them aren't even audible in the final mix. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a it was a way of of building recordings at that point with multi-tracks and you have 16 tracks on you know Layla um from the from the start and all things must pass is eight tracks and you don't get to 16 tracks until you get to Trident so they had more they had more room to play with um mm -hmm. to to overdub these parts and plus if you've got Dwayne Allman and Eric Clapton conceivably you could I don't think they're on the same track but if they had to be two of them could have played at the same time mm -hmm. that's so right and those yeah. Those are, you can separate those better. So when, you know, for our presentations, for example, we're able to isolate their various sub performances uh, on those, those massively layered songs. Are you, you're talking about the Derek and the Domino stuff? That's right, Layla, yeah. Yeah. Would you know why there was a need for a second version of Isn't It a Pity? Did George feel like the first version was too produced? Let's well, do he, a simple raw one. Alan White said that he felt like the first, he said it was a difficult song to get and that the first person just didn't, they didn't feel like they were getting it. And it's funny to think that we look at it now and we think, well, so that was actually an abandoned song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they moved on to the second one. But I think, you know, they got a master and they said, well, you know, let's do it again. And he's, he's you know, we mentioned this, in the book, he, he talks about how somebody just started playing it and they picked up on it and they just, they went into that slow version. Um, so I, I think it was, you know, he didn't know at that time because we're early in the process, first, first week of sessions, really. Hmm. He doesn't know which, which is the version he's going to pick. And then once he gets to the end and he's thinking, I'm going to do a double, I'm going to do a triple album and I'll just include both versions. Why not? <laughs> yeah. You know? I'm curious about uh, if I, if I if I may jump in with a question about Apple Jam, uh, and and how that came, where that sat in the sessions, and how that came to be something that George wanted to include in the album as its own, almost like its own little separate entity. Um, were they really ad libbed and spur of the moment things, or was there a conscious attempt? Okay, guys, time to jam, and make sure you record this. I mean, I, I think that largely came out of Clapton and Derek and the Dominoes. You know, they're, you, we, we showed the tape boxes for two of the sessions for their first single, which was withdrawn, as we all know. Um, but you see the, the running time on a couple of those songs, you know, eight and a half minutes. That's not going to be a single. They're just jamming. And that's the energy of that group. They're, they're on fire and they're just going to follow that. And so I think a lot of those jams were coming out of that. Plus, you've got a bunch of guitarists. You got Clapton, you got George Harrison. They're just, they're going to want to blow off steam. You know, the, the Beatles did that after you know, the release of Sgt. Pepper. They just jammed for a day. And George Martin thought it was a waste of time and ridiculous. But they, <laughs> they, they needed to release tension and, and mm. you know, just sort of, sort of let their hair down, so to speak. And yet, like Ginger Baker appearing at that point. Right. Well, uh, that that's something we just learned. Um, that session was from from early 1969, and it was it was best I can understand a plastic Ono session, plastic Ono band session that John and Yoko weren't involved in. But something about that rung a bell for George over you know a year and a half later, and he thought I want to include that in this jam disc. So it's, it's not planned, certainly. It's all sort of coming together as he's putting the record together and he hears some of these jams and he thinks, oh, these are pretty good. And then he decides to pull his other track in. So and, it's, and, it's, it's, it's yeah, a okay. very fluid fluid process. I guess what I'm saying. Uh, the track you're referring to, I Remember Jeep, yes. wasn't that from a Billy Preston session? 
yeah, one of his it's, albums. It's, yeah, it's, it's labeled, isn't it labeled uh, as a plastic ono band? Like, isn't that written somewhere? I'm just, I'm looking, I'm remembering. I haven't, I haven't put this down in print from the from the notes in the box, mm-hmm. the box set. Okay, I think that's what it says though. Don't don't quote me on that without checking it. But um, <laughs> okay. Alan, did I, I mean, you have I, anything? I take your word for yeah. it. If it's, if it's Billy Preston, I'm just, I was just saying that it was at some point labeled a plastic ono band. Um, yeah, but I think you're okay. Right. Well, I'll, I'll look that up right now. Alan, did you want to um, ask yeah. a few um, more questions? Having recently uh, myself gone from being a sole practitioner to a collaborative book writer, I'm wondering how the two of you um, divided the labor, so to speak. Well, we, uh, we, you know, we made some of it up as we went along, um, but uh, it was our COVID project, right? You know, we, <laughs> right. um, uh, like, like, like the world, mm-hmm. we were um, in lockdown. And so typically uh, at first we had the idea of, um, and correct me if you remember it differently, Jason, but Jason, starting with George and picking up after uh, Get Back, and then I was going to run with uh, with uh, Derek and the Dominoes so that we could find a way to bring them together to graft one upon the other. Uh, but then, of course, as we move forward um, and we started to share text, then we would we would find ourselves grafting more. <laughs> limbs on onto that text. And of course, as we mentioned very early, um, we realized that the story needed to have a beginning and an ending. You know, it most of it takes place in 1970, but so many key facets of this story go right on through beyond George's death, right? So um, we felt like we needed that, that uh, prelude and postscript too. Did you... Um you were aware, I guess, when you started that the reissue was going to be coming out or, or were you not? That was in the air, but nobody had confirmed that mm-hmm. yet. Um, it, the timing just happened to be perfect with the book coming out two weeks before the box set came out. Um, so right. thank you, Harrison Estate, for that. Um, but no, I mean, it, I, I agree that's what I remember too, is Ken said, you take George, I'll take Eric. And then as we were sort of finishing our chunks of text, we would send things back and forth. And, and I'd say, Oh, I want to add this. And he'd send me something. And, you know, we'd, we'd, we just sort of swap back and forth or, you know, I would see something like, Oh, Oh my God, I didn't write about this. I have to write this, you know, hmm. um, that happened a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, that was, <laughs> a panic moment. <laughs> is that, is that how your uh, co-writing process is working, Alan? Um, well, a little, so there are aspects of that. Um, the way we're doing it mostly is Adrian is doing a lot of the primary research and I'm doing ba- most of the writing, but he's doing some writing and I'm doing some research. Um, and then we sort of run it all through the cozenator <laughs> just for <laughs> stylistic consistency. Um, but we're, we're constantly even, you know, we finished the first volume and we're constantly coming up with things that we think we should add. Um, yeah. And seeing as it's already uh, way too long, I'm not sure how we're going to get away with that, but, but we'll see uh, how we can sweet talk our editors into it's well, two idea. things. One, that is my most anticipated uh, book that I can't wait to get. And secondly, it does is the Cozenator available as Mac software? <laughs> I was going to say, if there's an app for that, that'd be yeah, great. I would pay good money for the Cozenator. <laughs> I see. Okay, well, you're not allowed to work on one. <laughs> yeah. So I I have information here that I remember Jeep. Yes. Hmm. It actually says the recording that became I Remember Jeep started as an untitled jam with George, Billy Preston, Eric Clapton, Ginger Baker, and Klaus Vorman from March 29th, 1969, during a short preliminary session for Billy Preston's first Apple Records solo album. Hmm. So that would be, that's the way God planned it. A few weeks later on May 12th, overdubs were added and the song was mixed with John and Yoko. It was titled Jam Peace, 
by the Plastic Arnold Band, as noted on two tape mix boxes and the corresponding acetate disc. The use of Plastic Auto Band predates the recording of Give Peace a Chance, the first hmm. official release by two weeks. So John and Yoko are not on the recording. They just mixed it. Right. But it's interesting that they considered it a Plastic Auto Band recording, even though they're not it's, it's, on it. <laughs> yeah. That's just how plastic the Plastic Auto Band was. Yes. Hmm. Beyond plastic. Yes. <laughs> I guess um, I guess we should also ask you guys what you think of the remix and the uh, the whole production of the, of the reissue. Ken, you go for that. Sure. Um, I <laughs> uh, I you know like like many of these experiences that we have, I started out really adoring it, <laughs> um, but for the most part, when we're talking about the original "All Things Must Pass" album, it has confirmed for me how much I enjoy that record and that will be my standard listening experience. The original. You know? Yeah. I really, I find several of the songs to be kind of cloying really at this point, like Sir Frankie crisp. I really, I'm running back to the original on that. Um, hmm. As far as the other tracks, I really enjoy the outtakes um, cosmic empire, et cetera. You know, those are wonderful to have uh, with all of the, the gloss of per- professional production but you know as far as remixes go this isn't for me in the same league as giles martin's remixes where i can enjoy them uh in a in a, in a more lasting fashion mm-hmm. um i i this one sent me scurrying back to uh to the original interesting yeah i i texted somebody the other day and i said uh I said, this is not doing George any favor favors as a lead vocalist. It's it's like he's pushed too far forward and he see it it's not as strong. It's like it doesn't need his voice doesn't really need to stand out from these tracks as much as just be a part of the whole sound, even though it's nice to be able to hear that clarity. Um I I gravitate toward the original mixes too. Um you know, it's, it's sort of an interesting novelty, but it's not it's not grabbing me. It's something something even like in Isn't It a Pity, the first version, it sounded slick. Something about it just sounded a little too polished, I guess. Um, those are, you know, my impressions after a few listens over the course of a few weeks. Um, that's kind of yeah. where I've, I've, I've landed with it. How about the surround? I don't have the surround set up, um, mm. uh, but I, I do love the demos. I love the outtakes. I mean, I think the Isn't It a Pity, the outtake that opened the disc is just great. You know, it's so, <laughs> so, so George. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Very appropriate to make that track one, just to make yes. you laugh at the very beginning. Yes. I, I mean, I also think it was a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a comment, not just about the process of making a record and how much you have to rehearse sometimes, but also Spectre's thing of running people through rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal before calling take one is probably a little bit of that um, on display there. Hmm. And it seems to be apparent to me based on everything you were saying about the way the album was mixed well, you can bring down the wall of sound on certain songs, the songs that um, are more bombastic, if you want to use that word, like, like Let It Down or, or Wawa, and then bring up George's vocals. And you can also, but you can, you can remove the reverb on the vocals because the vocals sound dry and they, they sound isolated that way. Right. And some people love it for that reason. And there are times when George's voice is really strong, but sometimes there's a frailty to it. And yeah. you don't want to hear the imperfection there. Maybe in a demo, yeah, you know, but not in the finished product. So, um, yeah, it's, it's become apparent through this remix that you can only kind of lower the sound of the wall of sound, bring it down in the mix, dampen it a bit. And when you do that, you, you're removing a lot of the dynamic range and, and the, I don't know, the full overall feel, you know, that, that it had originally. It's baked um, in. <laughs> yeah. Well, well the, the way it all blends together. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the a great mix you want to blend together. You want it to sort of come at you as a as a as a cohesive thing that you hear, not 
oh, listen to those drums, listen to those vocals, listen, listen to that. You know, you, it's not necessarily that you pick out individual. And Spectre's Wall of Sound, I think, is the most extreme example of this, where it's the whole literally wall coming at you. Um, but I think in, in general, my experience with just listening and, and dabbling and mixing myself is, is that, you know, you, to create a mix, you want everything to sort of be cohesive and, and be as one piece, not necessarily one element to stand out. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things with his vocals in this is that they, they do seem separate from the rest of the mix in some places. Hmm. I find that my taste changes with these remixes, all of them. Going back to Sgt. Pepper and the White Album mix, I question, do I like this better than the original? Of course I don't, but maybe I do. And then it'll, I'll hear something different the next time I listen. Uh, the first time I listened to All Things Must Pass, I loved it. Um, now I'm a little, I backed off a couple of, you know, notches with certain things that I didn't didn't strike me as well, or perhaps I'm even listening in a better system with better headphones than the first time. Um, I think for me personally, when all is said and done for all of these mixes, I'm glad to have them, but I'll always go back to the original in, in every instance. Yeah. Um, you know, I agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to listen to any remix just out of curiosity. I think it, I mean, on that, on some level, it's just kind of cool to be able to hear an alternate version. It's like, I think for me, I learned, I think it was from the first batch of Yoko remixes of John's albums and how each, it seems as they staggered, each one seemed to be tinkered with more and more. Um, and I was hearing, wait a minute, Imagine sounded like Imagine. Plastic Ono Band had a couple of maybe weird starts or endings that I didn't hear. By the time you get to rock and roll and, and, uh, uh, sometime in New York City or the last ones that it was drastic to my ears how the liberties that uh, were taken with those albums and I enjoyed it but when all is said and done I always go back to the original mix when I'm you know years later yeah. right I mean the thing that we also that I mean I try to think about is that you know maybe I'm not the audience necessarily for this remix or any of the, the Beatles remixes you know maybe there are people who are going to be growing up with these mixes now and that's what they'll gravitate to. And then they'll discover mm. these, these mixes from the sixties and seventies and say like, that sounds weird. Like, what yeah. is that? You know? Mm. And so then you, have, you have significant, you have significant yeah. issues then though, with right with intentionality because sure. Um, people often gravitate toward the latest thing. It's the primacy of newness, right? And uh, it will be interesting to see, you know, we all need to hang on for several more decades. Uh, <laughs> that's an order. Uh, but we, it will be interesting to see just how much that phenomenon comes true. Yeah. There's, there's too much of an emphasis on what sounds right for today. Yeah. And um, we Master have no iTunes. <laughs> yeah Ugh. and and who knows 20 years from now if people will look back at this and say well that sounds dated or it doesn't sound right. right but you could always go back to the original and say well that's the way you know george approved it the way george then. planned it yeah, yeah. But, you that's know, the way george planned it, it, it it's <laughs> funny about remixes um there are two things um one is, um, I was thinking when you were talking about, you know, things that you know, I think Darren was talking about hearing new things, even if it's not a remix. I mean, I remember the, when the first four Beatles CDs came out, people mm -hmm. were talking about how, yeah, you can hear Ringo's drum pedal. But the thing is that if you go back to the LP, you still hear Ringo's drum pedal. It's just that you didn't notice it, you know, and it was that because it's a new remix, remaster, whatever it is, you focus so closely on it that you're, you want to hear new things and you're hearing things that you didn't notice before, but they were there, you know, they were there. If you go back to the originals, they're still there. Um, and the second thing, um, I, can't, I think I forgot what the second thing was. Um, nope, never mind. <laughs> I had another idea. <laughs> I want to first was pretty good. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Uh, I, I will kind of, I would imagine running out of time, ran out of time or will run out of time on the podcast, not on life, but the question uh, we didn't touch on yet. We didn't jump ahead. <laughs> the not. dynamic of the live in Japan tour uh, of their relationship at that point compared to where they were at George and, and, and Eric in uh, 70. Uh, now decades have gone by and George venturing out on the road with Eric at his side, um, what was what was their friendship at that point like and their role for each other uh, for that tour? And why didn't George go on and maybe tour North America after that? You know, that is such a, a fascinating episode and one that I thought I understood prior to our, our work on this book. And, and now I realize I didn't. You know, that was Eric feeling like he was doing a solid for George. You know, oh. here we, here's your opportunity to go out with my live band, my crack band. We're ready to go. We'll feature you. We'll showcase you. And, um, and Eric seemed, you know, by all reports, we were able to, to, to glean. He seemed very disappointed in George's reaction. Um, there were a few personal issues that were taking place, including Eric's ex-girlfriend being along for the ride uh, that upset him. But he really felt like George didn't take to it. And at a certain level, George didn't take to it. Right. George did not enjoy uh, live performance. And I think that's why we don't see a, a part two of that, you know, a phase of that. We all would have loved to have seen it. And I imagine all of us would have been there for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would have longed to have had that experience. But it's pretty clear that Eric feels like he is he has really put himself out there and made this possible for George. And George did not. Uh, George was kind of going through the motions. Well, after the 1974 tour, I think George never recovered from the bad critical reaction that he got from that. But maybe this was a test to see if George could enjoy it once again. So maybe that's what George and Eric were thinking. Just test the waters and see if you still, if there's, if you get any enjoyment out of being on stage, maybe that's what the intention was. I always thought it was going to be a warm up to coming to America. Right. Well, he didn't have the vocal problems this time. Yeah. No. Yeah. He could have, you would think enjoyed it more. I thought of it. <laughs> I was thinking of um, <laughs> the, the newly reissued first Eric Clapton album. Um, the deluxe set has the Tom Dowd mix that was released. It has Eric Clapton's mix and it has Delaney Bramlett's mix and the pretty different mixes. Um, and this is, I think, a case where people complaining about, you know, putting mustaches on the Mona Lisa or whatever, can't really do that because these were contemporaneous mixes, you know, and one of them is Clapton's own mix. Um, the other is, you know, Delaney Bramlett was, as you guys describe in the book, was really pretty important to, to this project. And then Tom Dowd, who had a long history with Clapton. Um, and uh, there you have three totally different views of that album, you know, far more radically different than I think this new mix of All Things Must Pass is compared with the original or Giles's mixes are with the Beatles. So what do you make of that? I mean, it's three different perspectives on how to mix a record. You know, Delaney mm -hmm. Bramlett had very much his own ideas of what an album should sound like. And, you know, Clapton did too. I don't know how much experience Clapton had mixing anything. <laughs> um, and obviously Tom Dowd was going to win out on this one because he's Tom Dowd, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, he, he sort of could have figured that you know, he was going to have the best mix of the three anyway. Um, and does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And does. Yeah. Um, I mean, but that, you know, that it, it's hard to get around the fact that that's really a Delaney and Bonnie record in so many ways. Delaney's Delaney's the prime mover in that. And, you know, he's getting Clapton out front. He's giving him some, um, some confidence to step out on his own and write songs and sing and be the sort of the front man. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, it's interesting to hear those different takes on, I mean, I honestly don't listen to that record very often. I probably listen to it more just for this book than I ever have in my life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. 
so I'm not, you know, I haven't done an intimate study of like I did for all things must pass where I must have listened to it a hundred times last year. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it just goes to show how three people can have such three, three just different ideas of what a, what a record should sound like, what a mix should sound like, what's important, what, what do you showcase? Right. How do you, how do you make that sound all come together or how don't you make that sound come together? Yeah. It seemed like a little masterclass in mixing to me that, that release. And I just thought the only thing that was missing is they should have given us all the raw tracks so that we could mix it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. See what we think, you know? <laughs> I think that's, I'd like to suggest that for Apple next, if we could just, you know, have all the tracks ourselves to mix, just, just show us once and for all how difficult this is. Mm-hmm. We'll learn our lesson. I promise. <laughs> I'd pay for that. Yeah. yeah. Darren. All right. Do you have any no, closing? Um... <laughs> okay. Well, I think that uh, kind of puts a wrap on our show. Uh, before we end, why don't we each give uh, our viewers some information, how they can get in contact with us and let us know what's going on in our lives beyond this moment. Uh, starting with you, Ken. Sure. I'm at everythingfab4.com. And, uh, you know, uh, actually, Jason and I are starting to work on a, a new book about 1974. We're really uh, excited about and, and it will cover that ill-fated tour for sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Among many other things. <laughs> I mean, everything going on in music in 1974 or more uh, Beatles? Beatles 74. Beatles. Beatles. Okay. With- with a backdrop of other things going on too, of course. Okay, cool. You never stop working, Ken, and you too, Jason. Tell the folks about your your podcast show for those who are not familiar with it. Well, yeah, I'm. It's producing the Beatles. Uh, it's on iTunes and everywhere you get podcasts, and uh, you can go to the website, download directly from there if you if you don't want to deal with iTunes or the other podcast platforms. Um, you can also email me from there. Uh, or just just producing the Beatles at uh, gmail.com and follow me on Twitter at PT Beatles. And there's an Instagram account too, where it's more picture driven, but um, yeah, e- any of those you can follow, get in touch. All and, right. And new episodes of the podcast coming soon. Okay. How many have you done already? I think it's, I'm up to 11 or 12 now. They're, they're very production heavy. So they take a long time to put together and, and a lot of moving parts often. So uh, it's it's very complicated. I'm a one man show. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't have to explain. I bet your your listeners are very appreciative of all the work you put into it. Yes, I'm, I'm, people are very nice, and I'm grateful that uh, that they write and they they express how much they like it. We mm-hmm. did one with an awful lot of reverb, but it was not. <laughs> <laughs> an awful lot. <laughs> Darren. How about you? Um, you could uh, find me on Facebook. I have two pages, Darren DeVivo and um, uh, Darren DeVivo, WFUVDJ and Beatles Podcaster, I think is the name of it. But if you hook, hook up with me on one, I'll send you the link to the other. I uh, try to keep the content in div- uh, different, the two pages. Uh, I don't always succeed at that, but uh, just Google Darren, not Google, look up, search on Facebook, Darren DeVivo, and you should find them both. So send me a friend request and one, follow me on the other. If you want to email me, email me at WFUV. Uh, and it's my name, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. And uh, if you want to tune in, Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m., uh, 90.7 FM in the New York City area. Saturdays, 1 to 4 in the afternoon. Uh, and if you're not in the New York City metro area, you can stream us at WFUV.org or uh, download the WFUV app and listen there. And it's a great radio station that I highly recommend, especially if you want to get into a lot of today's new rock and find out what's good out there as far as new releases. And Darren introduces us to so much of it on the channel. Well, sure. Okay, Alan, your turn. Okay, you can reach me on Facebook. I've got two pages. There's Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remix, the despectorized version. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And uh, you can actually write to all of us at thingswesaidtoday, radio show at gmail.com. 
and uh, actually uh, increasingly people do. And it's interesting because we sometimes get into interesting discussions. People give us their ideas about things that we can do and uh, feel free to contact us. We also have a, um, a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. And in keeping with the uh, dual Facebook pages, kind of like dual drumming, Ringo and Keltner, you know, we have um, things we said today, Beatles radio fans, and just plain things we said today. Um, the podcasts go up on all of them and on Podbean and on YouTube. And please subscribe to us if you want to. All right. As for me, uh, you can write to me directly at everylittlething at att.net. Make sure you check out my website, which has loads of audio interviews with lots of people in the Beatle world. That's at kenmichaelsradio.com. There's also a page on there that lists all the radio stations that carry my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Just find the page for that, and it tells you all the stations, the broadcast times, links to their websites. So you can stream the show. You can only stream the show live. It's not available on demand. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always, every single week, Beatles Trivia where you can win one out of 10 prizes, including this brand new book right here that we've been talking about, All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison Clapton and other assorted love songs. That's one of the 10 prizes that you can win. And um, yeah, that's at my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. I have Ken, my YouTube page. Hold What's your that? Copy. Hold your copy of the book up. Yeah. I got a backwards printing. <laughs> <laughs> is this is it different for the promotional? No. No uh, wonder why I've been reading the whole thing backwards. <laughs> He's seeing it back. You you seeing it backwards on your screen. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Ken's doing. He's into all the, you know, backwards music and everything. So I'm it's a little true. I'm a little overtired, so <laughs> ignore me. Okay. Uh, let's see, Ken Michaels Radio, the YouTube channel, has got lots of interviews on there, and Jason and Ken will be on it shortly to do more talk about the book. And then there's Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which Ken is a frequent uh, member of on the show. You never know when he might join us, you pop up. never know. <laughs> yeah, we're doing a show tonight, but by the time this gets out there, that'll be too late. But we'll be talking about All Things Must Pass, the new box set what we think about it on the show and uh, just go to our Facebook page, talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cast every other Monday night at 9 PM Eastern. And then it's on every platform imaginable uh, for you to listen to. And also on our YouTube page. So please subscribe to that as well as our page, things we said today and Ken Michaels radio. I think I covered everything. So uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. And thank you, Jason and Ken, for joining us. And uh, thank you all for watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.